Uh, okay, my name's Liam. Um, uh, I work on this game, Empires of the Undergrowth. Um, just so I've got an idea, um, how many of you play or have played? Okay, ni nice mix. So, you've watched people play, okay. Yeah, that, a lot of people do that, yeah. Um, so, I've, I've tried to make this uh, presentation uh, accessible for people that have no idea what this is. I uh, don't know if I've succeeded. Um, and there's some behind the scenes bits for uh, those of you who are familiar with it. Um, this is the second ever presentation I've done about Empires of the Undergrowth. The other one being an hour ago. Uh, I could talk about it for days. Uh, it, was, it was a bit difficult to, to figure out what I was going to talk about today. Um, I've tried to hone in on a few ideas uh, around game design. Uh, where we're trying to emulate nature in a in a video game, and and some of the problems we had, and 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 how we how we dealt with those. Um, the development team is quite small. There's uh, three founding developers. So there's me. Um, there's Matt Kent. He's uh, here, um, and John Connor, um, who's not here at the moment. Um, and then uh, Mike, who's recording. He's our community manager. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've got another developer on board, Daniel Coates. He makes environment art. So um, it most recently, actually not most recently, but in these pictures, he worked on this lovely uh, swamp area. Um, and there's also Daniel Possenflake. He's our, our marketing manager. So he joined us more recently. So before I start talking about um, the, the, uh, the nature-inspired uh, game elements, I just need to give a little bit of history um, about the... Uh, the company and, and the game. So this is a really long timeline. Um, it was a little bit shocking when I when, when I was putting this together and I realized how far back it had to go. Uh, there's 11 years on there. So somewhere in early 2013, uh, John and Matt uh, decided they wanted to make uh, a game as a sort of portfolio piece, um, which was going to be uh, something called Dungeon Keeper, but with ants. So Dungeon Keeper is an old game from 1997 uh, that we all played when we were kids um, where you're uh, a master of a subterranean dungeon that you dig out, uh, you raise monsters in there uh, and they fight against the, the forces of good. Um, and the general idea was, we like this game, let's try and make something similar, but how about instead of monsters, uh, we put ants in, that, that, that should be good. Um, it wasn't like a sort of a really serious idea. It wasn't something we were expecting to um, turn into uh, a living. Uh, and we all worked on it in, in bits and pieces. Um, and the next thing that happened was in early 2014, we founded our, our company, Slug Disco. Uh, this actually had nothing to do with making the game. Um, me and Matt were finishing our postgraduate studies and we had no funding, so we were, we were doing little jobs. Um, and we could... Uh, we, we managed to get some contract work to make some educational software, which uh, was lucky, but the university wouldn't pay us unless we had a company bank account. So that's the origin story of the, uh, the actual studio. Nothing to do with games whatsoever. Um, things uh, ticked on a bit. Of course, all, all of us are busy with, uh, with our lives, but we managed to get together a prototype and we did a, a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. Now, at, at the end of uh, 2015, the Kickstarter was still um, in its... Let's say that there were lots of really big Kickstarters getting lots of funding with not really much effort or sort of um, uh, backing behind the idea. So, are we too close? Um, and unfortunately, we didn't get uh, funding for that. Um, and we really thought we did. Uh, we, we were going to because um, just a year before this, um, somebody managed to raise $55,000 to make potato salad. So we thought, oh, an ant video game, like, no problem. Um, unfortunately not, though. Uh, too many games had been on Kickstarter at this point and sort of flopped. Um, uh, hadn't, like, people had paid for it and nothing had happened, basically. So n nobody had much faith in us. They'd never heard of us. We'd never made a game before. We, d we did get these 300 backers. Um, and we thought, okay, so maybe there's something there. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have any money to carry on, um, and Matt, who was sort of 
uh, the heart of the, 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 the programming side of things at the time, was going to move on with his life. Um, but just in the nick of time, uh, unfortunately for him, um, we got a grant from the UK Games Fund, uh, which was £25,000. It was really uh, welcome. Um, that fund is still going, um, but it's incredibly competitive now. I wouldn't want to apply for it now. There's like rounds and interviews and everything. But at the end of 2015, this was the first time it ran. I think they had very few applicants. And I think they gave us the money because there was nobody else to give it to. So we were really lucky with that. Um, and then we started working on uh, remaking the game a bit. So up until this point, it was for, made for mobile. Um, and I'm going to have to, I've just got to describe what a game engine is. So um, if you imagine a, a game engine is like the foundations of a, of a computer game, so that the physics, the, the way pictures appear on the screen, um, how things move around. So it's all very basic and you build the game on top of that. Um, and there are commercial solutions. So Unreal Engine 4 is one that we're allowed to use and it really helps speed everything up. We weren't doing it before then. Uh, we were actually using an engine that Matt made himself, which was uh, an incredible feat for, for somebody who had never done it before. And this is how the game used to look when it was a mobile game. Um, just just uh, running on our personal devices. Um, so we tried Kickstarter again, there we go, with our, with our new prototype and we got our funding. So it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was enough to keep everything going, added to the, the, the grant we got from the Games Fund. Um, again, I need to just describe what early access is. So we moved towards a launch, we were trying to release the game and that ended up happening at the end of 2017. Um, but we hadn't finished it. So early access is a way of releasing a game before it's done. Uh, people can pay for it, um, they can play it, but it's not finished. Uh, and the idea is that they're funding further development and you carry on making it. Um, this had a bad reputation in 2017. We didn't really want to do it, but we had no choice. Um, we, had to, we had to do something or we were gonna run out of money. Then after that, things started to go quite well. We were selling copies. We had a little bit more time. We added leaf cutters into the game. Uh, and then there was a really long development cycle to add fire ants. And now we're on the, the last stretch, hopefully. Uh, this timeline shouldn't go too much further. Um, and we will launch uh, the, the final version of the game. Okay, so on to the actual uh, topic, uh, gamifying nature. I've, I've picked three areas um, of the game. One is how uh, ants move around, um, how you control that as a player. Um, there's uh, how nests are constructed, uh, ant nests, uh, and also how we chose species to add into the game um, and looked at their natural abilities and, and turned them into um, game mechanics. Okay, so this is my only animated slide. Um, I had to put this in just to show off my high school PowerPoint skills. Um, ant movement and control. So. In a, we, we, there's sort of two ways we could go with this. There's, there's, a, um, there's a type of game called a real-time strategy game where um, you can move all of your individual um, pieces, uh, say units, ants, they'd be ants in this case, you can tell them exactly where to go. Move there, stop there, move there, stop there. Um, and it's very uh, regimented um, and it doesn't really look like a or feel like a real ant colony. And a lot of the fun of, uh, or the, the interest in ants is uh, the, the, like the fascinating things that they do, watching them, uh, enjoying just staring at them really as they go about their business. Um, and we didn't get that with that style of movement. But then if you go too far the other way and you make a simulation, it becomes more of an academic tool where you actually aren't playing a game, you just maybe drop a bit of food in and, and watch what happens. So we had to find somewhere in between those two things. Uh, just to describe that uh, a little bit better, this is a real-time strategy game called StarCraft. Um, you can see these are your little soldiers, and you can click on them, um, put them in, uh, like select several of them, and you can tell them exactly where to go, and they just go there and, and stand still. So it's very good for uh, sort of a, this kind of space uh, warfare game, but not particularly good for, for insects. So this is what, what we had, um, this is the game. 
So instead of moving your ants directly, you give jobs to the colony. So the player's um, painting some of these tiles over here to become nursery chambers. And these tiles here uh, to be dug out. This is what you're faced with when you play. And the little worker ants, these are um, Formica fusca ants. They're going about their business. They're, they're doing what sort of the will of the, of the colony master. Um, but you're not telling them directly. You're not saying, you go and do that, you go and do that. You just put the jobs down um, and let them deal with that. And you have this nice sort of, you can watch the colony doing its thing without having to click too many times, but you're still in control. Um, I'll brush over this fairly quickly, but I, I wanted to put it in just to point out how awkward it can be. Um, if you're making uh, a game where you're telling things exactly where to go, if they go to the wrong place, it's the player's fault. They've, they've told them to go there, um, and they wanted them to go over there, it's, it's the player's fault because they've sent them the wrong way. If the computer's controlling where things go, and you've just given a general idea of what you want to happen, and you're expecting something to happen and it doesn't, you get annoyed at me um, for, for not setting it up right. Um, and so there has to be some sort of uh, invisible brain that controls what these ants are doing. This is actually a really awkward problem. Um, you can come up with algorithms like ants always do the nearest job, these circles are ants, these crosses are jobs to do. Um, this is what you want, uh, this is what actually happens. You want them to go to that job and that job, but because both of them are nearer to that job, they go to that one first. One of them goes, oh, but it's already been done, and comes down here, and that's very annoying as a player because you can't tell the ant to do that. You can come up with more complicated things like having a, a job reservation system. So once a job has been reserved, no other ant can go and do it, but that if there's one job and two ants, how do you know which ant is going to reserve it first? Uh, this is what you want, but invariably this, 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 this is what will happen. Uh, some ant really far away will go and try and do it and you'll just be getting frustrated that someone's right next to what you want to do. Um, and so on and so forth. There are lots of problems, basically. So we have this job manager. Um, all of the jobs that the colony has to do are in a list, ordered by priority and the job manager dishes, dishes them out to the ants. And then for an extra layer of complexity, the uh, ants that are doing jobs or going to do jobs can, can swap them around with other ants to try and keep things efficient as you're pasting things down and the, and the whole system's moving around. Um, so I've got a video of this uh, in practice in, in the game. Uh, this is in a, a leaf cutter colony. Um, some workers, uh, I think there is, those are minor ants, they've just dropped off some leaves um, and the little minims are going to collect them out, out, out to this, uh, this drop-off point. They collect the little pieces and they're taking them to the, um, the, the fungus gardens to turn them into fungus. Of course, everything happens really fast because uh, it's, a, it's a video game and you're playing it. Um, the, the only thing the player's done here is just put two jobs down. There's no clicking going on really. And when they put those jobs down, the currency of this is um, fungus. So they've spent some fungus putting those down. And by spending the fungus, waste fungus is generated and then jobs are generated for that. And all the little um, minimants are going, taking those things about so you can see them all here, taking the, um, the waste to the, uh, the refuse dump here. Uh, the one thing we did want the player to have control of was um, being able to move ants around for uh, battle. So um, the, 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 the fighting in Empires of the Undergrowth is like turned up a notch, I think, from reality, just to make it more uh, intense. Um, and when you have enemies that are attacking your base, uh, that's, that's a big thing where the player is going to want a lot of control. They, they're going to have different styles and strategies. So they don't really want a manager an invisible manager handling that, it would have to be way more complicated and it probably just not do what they wanted to do anyway. It was very sad. Poor Queen. That's a, that's a, I don't, I don't, I've never seen a, a lot of devil's coach horses there. Very, very accurate. I think the same thing happened with Matt, and that's why they're in the game. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here, the, the player's doing a much better job. They've got this pheromone marker, and they've placed it down 
uh, and their soldier ants are going uh, up the tunnel to defend against the, the, the devil's coach horses that are coming to try and eat the queen. Uh, and hopefully they'll be victorious. Everything's happening um, really quickly here, so the development of the ants are happening really quickly because you can see the worker ants, they're going to and from the queen, taking little eggs and they're turning into larvae and, and pupating and then they hatch with a pop and the, and the soldiers come out. And we, we won that time. Okay, so it is another example of the, of the pheromone marker movement. These are some fire ants in the swamp. Um, and the players moved the marker from there to there, and they all sort of swarm around the new marker. And they, uh, a few of them will always go to and from the nest, even though they're not carrying anything, because they, they haven't found anything there yet. Just to give this feel of the, of the trail going, going to and from the nest, and how you're always connected to your nest with your group of ants that's, that's out exploring. Was that me? Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. I'll try not to move so much. Um, okay, so the next part was, uh, say, base design. It's nest design for us. Um, we wanted to make the, the player's uh, base, the player's nest, the, 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 the ant nest, look kind of inspired by nature. Now, we already had this idea where um, tiles were being dug out. So uh, this is an example of a player's nest. These bits, you can, you can see before, I, I could paint them and tell the ants to dig them out. Uh, they can make these rooms. I can then designate the, the grid tiles as nursery chambers. So the, the player has the option of sort of setting up this nature-inspired space with chambers and highways for the ants to move around. Um, but in reality, they're not going to do that unless there's a compelling reason to, even though that looks good and, and feels good. Um, once you start playing, your objective is just to win. You start trying to win. So if it's not efficient to win like that, you're not going to do it. You'll just make, you'll dig everything out make a big blob and uh, that's how you're going to play. So we had to add some game mechanics to try and uh, trick the player into setting up their base like this so it always looks kind of nature inspired. Um, one way we did that was with, a, with an upgrade system so everything happens on these hex tiles. Um, the, the, each, each tile can be upgraded twice so it starts off at level one can be upgraded to level two and then to level three. And the way it, can, it gets upgraded is it has to have neighbors, tiles that are next to it of the same type. So once you've got six tiles next to a tile of the same type, it can be upgraded um, and then that contributes more. And you have this pattern where you can put, you, if you put tiles together, they, they're more easy to upgrade. Um, then we added in walls of the nest. These are really old uh, pictures when, uh, I was coming up with how the upgrade system would work. It's my artwork in MS Paint. Oh, sorry about this. I don't know where else I can put it. Um, this is an example of it happening in the game. So I'm digging out this, uh, this is a, a seven tile space. Uh, and we're gonna make a leaf cutter refuse chamber. So I'm painting down three tiles. Uh, and you can see uh, they're all level one, but this one's got five out of six points, five out of six, two out of six. If I put another one down, this has got six out of six because it's got three tiles next to it and three walls next to it, so that can be upgraded. And then once that one's upgraded, it contributes points, two points to the, to the neighbors, so they can be upgraded now. And then, and then the middle one can be upgraded. So you can start to see sort of the benefits of putting tiles next to each other and, and in a chamber. And if we finish this chamber off uh, and upgrade all of the tiles, we can actually get the middle one up to, up to level two because that's now got 12 points. That's what it needs for level two. Uh, so this is, this is all uh, helping convince the player it's a good idea to put the tiles in a little chamber like that. Um, the other thing we wanted were these highways uh, in the nest. Um, 
And so we wanted the player to keep those clear. Uh, and one way we did this is we just set up that if, if you build a nursery in a highway, all of the ants slow down. Um, and over the course of, of the level, that has a, a big impact. And this is a, this is a type of leaf co colony that makes um, a refuse chamber underground. So um, I'm sure uh, you probably know a lot more about uh, leaf cutter ants than I do. Um, but they harvest leaves, uh, they take them uh, into the nest and they use them to cultivate fungus. They eat the fungus, but there are, there are waste products. There's uh, dead fungus and there are types of fungus that you don't uh, really want in the nest. Um, and that all gets taken to a dump. Some species dump the waste outside the nest. Some have a special chamber inside the nest to put the waste. Um, and in, 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 the, in the indoor chamber set up, some of the ants actually work in the, in the chamber, like moving the waste around. And they have a, a short lifespan because they get diseased more easily. Um, and the, the other ants like to keep those ants out of the rest of the colony. They're like um, the, the rubbish dump workers and they have to stay there and the other ants don't um, go near the rubbish dump essentially because they might get infected. So here, if you put a rubbish dump um, in the path of the ants, they get this green glow and they, ha they, walk, they walk more slowly and they, they get hurt more easily. So you really want to keep that out of the way, just like in nature and have a, have a dump off to the side somewhere so that your ants don't accidentally get infected. Okay, so the, the third section, choosing species and implementing abilities. Um, I chose for this slide just uh, a little picture of Wikipedia and the, the dangers of doing research on Wikipedia. So this, uh, the species, this is a, a page on Wikipedia for a species of driver ant. Uh, that almost made it into the game because early on we thought Wikipedia was uh, the best place for all knowledge and everything was correct there. Um, it only has one reference and the reference goes to a page that says this isn't a species. So that's, that's a good warning there. Always check your references. Okay, um, another little bit of background. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about how we chose species for the original early access launch. Um, there's some funny stories there. Um, this is a very short period of time between us putting a prototype together and actually releasing the game so people could play it. And we'd never made a game before, and we were all very overambitious. Um, and we invented this, uh, this plan in our heads of this really grand campaign. There'd be this imaginary island with all these different zones. Uh, and you'd play as a, a special imaginary species of ants that, that goes through the island, um, absorbing the traits of all of the other ants on the island. Um, uh, I, I pulled this out uh, for this, this presentation, an old campaign document, page one of 38. There's, there's several like this. Um, I, I think I, I wrote most of this, and I don't know um, what half of these things are. I don't remember what the, the pheromone sack is. Sounds interesting. Um, or what am, ant emblems are. Um, I don't remember what spawning holes are. Um, but anyway, we, we'd never made a game before, and this is actually typical of, of, a, of a first game if, you, if you're into game development, um, is you'll think you can make something really grand, and what actually happens is you realise how difficult it is and how long everything takes. Um, fortunately, we did realise in time that there was no way we were going to get this finished before the money ran out, and we we pivoted to a different plan. Uh, we decided we'd have this um, more modular uh, system of, of levels where we'd have uh, the formicarium, which is like a, the player's home. They have this hub world and they can work on their formicarium, add things to it, make it stronger. And, and from there, you can play these individual missions that are kind of like documentary um, episodes of an ant documentary, let's say. And they're not really related to each other or, or they don't have a story except they, the story is contained within the individual mission. And the nice thing is when you complete one of those missions uh, successfully you get some points for your formicarium uh, and you can spend those points uh, to make your formicarium strong and then you can do a formicarium challenge. If you pass the challenge you unlock more missions and so on and so forth and that meant that we could do this early access release that I talked about before by just choosing a section of this and saying, right, we've just got to do 
these four levels, uh, the formicarium, and, and a couple of these challenges. Now, we changed the plan around the beginning of 2017, and now we had a very short amount of time to get things finished, um, and not much money. And what that meant was, when we were making these documentary levels um, in the new plan, we had to use things that we'd already started to do um, for, the, for, the grand, um, for the grand scheme. And because this campaign was going to start at the bottom of this island, uh, Matt had already started working on a lot of things beach related. So a hermit crab, a fish, um, a, t a beach tiger beetle. And we had to keep those things because we couldn't just throw them out. We didn't have enough time. So that's why the start of the game, um, you, you start the first time you go out into the outer world, you're on a beach, which is not what we'd have chosen. We'd have chosen the rainforest or something, something more green and, and lush and, and interesting to start with. But that's, that's just yeah, the reason that came about. Um, I pulled out some old uh, uh, level design documents as well. Um, these are sketches of the maps for the, um, the third and fourth documentary missions. Um, so if, if anybody's familiar with the game, this one on the left here is The Harvest. Uh, the one on the right here is Queen of the Hill. That's how they started out. And I found some, um, uh, some ideas that we were putting together for the missions. Um, and I pulled this one out. This is uh, me explaining that I don't think there should be too many sardines on the beach or it'll look like an oil spill. Um, and you, you've got to sort of realize like we're, we're on a time limit here. We can only have so many objects. You can't just throw a cupcake in because then Matt's got to spend a week drawing a cupcake, right? And we've got a sardine, right? We don't have many things. So John's arguing with me here in the comments. Uh, he's saying this is not a compelling reason not to have lots of sardines. Um, and then this is, this is how the, the level looked. So, we have four sardines, that's where they came from, if, you, if you've played. And what, what I particularly like about this is how this evolved um, over time, because the game's become quite popular now, um, and it's, it's a PC game, and there's, there's a whole ecosystem around uh, uh, mobile games that we're not involved in, and a lot of people want to play this game on mobile, and over time, um, developers started to realize this, and they started to emulate the idea of Empires of the Undergrowth in a mobile game, there's now lots of um, copies with similar names. Um, they're all these like uh, freemium style games that so just sort of uh, click and buy and then wait a few hours and you can, you can pay to, to speed things up. Um, and they have these uh, really fun looking Facebook ads that's, that's nothing like the game. Um, and some of them steal assets uh, from us, some of them just kind of um, are a bit like the game. Um, but we saw one uh, a few months ago, which was really funny, a Korean game. Um, and of course, they're trying to use the idea of Empires of the Undergrowth to sell their game. And their thought process was, there's a lot of fish. We need a fish in our advert, right? So here, the, you, you've heard the origin story of the sardine. Here's now a, a Korean um, mobile game ad with a beach and a fish. Uh, and actually the music from the game as well. I don't think the game is anything like this. It just, it's like the butterfly effect, how things happen over time. Just because we didn't have time for a... Uh... <laughs> you're rising of the ants, if you're interested. Okay, so um, these are the three ant species we had in our early access release on the beach. Um, we chose Formica fusca black ants because we wanted to have a level with uh, slave maker ants. So we found um, a slave maker, Formica sanguinea, and that uh, parasitizes uh, Formica fusca ants. So we could have those two as a pair. Uh, and then we wanted Formica rufa ants because we know that they, uh, they can squirt formic acid. So that's just a great gameplay thing. Anyway, you can have um, your ranged ants like tanks. What we didn't realize actually when we were working on this um, was that the Formica rufa ant also parasitizes Formica fusca ants. Uh, they, the queen um, will in, infiltrate um, a Formica fusca nest, um, kill the queen and take over the colony 
um, and actually um, the workers, the first few black ant workers, will work for um, the roofer queen. That's one of the, the two ways a, a roofer uh, colony can be set up. They either join another super colony or they set out on their own with, uh, by infiltrating a Fusca colony. So um, just last minute in one of the levels, uh, one of the Formica roofer levels, uh, we had to swap out, well, we didn't swap it out, but what we did is we just put the corpse of a black ant queen next to your starting point, just so you know, and, and you start off by eating uh, the black ant queen and you start off with a few black ants just to give you the idea that this is, you've just taken over their nest. Um, I've got a video here of a, a slave maker raid in the game. This is probably um, more intense than, uh, I mean, I've never seen a real slave maker raid underground. Um, but you're the black ant colony you're trying to defend against these invaders. Some of them are fighting, some of them are running past, uh, grabbing uh, larvae and pupae. Um, but I'm doing a really good job of uh, dealing with them at the moment. We're not having any of that uh, slave making. So I think we'll get a, a perfect result. We didn't get any, any eggs out of the nest. We're dealing with some rove beetles at the same time. There we go, the last slave maker has been dealt with. And the narrator should tell us we've been successful. Oh, it's been cut off. They're back again, okay. <laughs> he does say something nice, uh, like uh, the, uh, the slave makers couldn't contend with the might of the black ant colony. Um, I think I cut it off there. Okay, so we've got some other creatures. Uh, a mole cricket, uh, a beach wolf spider, the devil's coach horse, beach tiger beetle, and a green fanged spider, which doesn't have green fangs. Um, be, uh, because I didn't call it that originally, uh, so Matt wouldn't have known. Um, I call this a funnel web spider in the game. I don't know if, strictly speaking, it is a funnel web spider. I think that might be reserved for particularly large Australian spiders, um, and this is, is a tiny little thing. Um, but it does make a web, and it does live at the end of a funnel, so uh, I'm happy enough with the term funnel web spider. Uh, nobody's pulled me up on it yet, so I'm wondering if someone will here. Um, so this is, the, this is the spider in action in the game. So it's got this web um, and any ant that walks on the web, it'll detect and the ant goes really slowly. And then it'll, it'll always try and grab an ant that's really far away. So it's just really annoying to deal with because it'll run past the ants, grab an ant, take it home and execute it. It's a really troublesome little creature when you're trying to make your nest underground. If you've got enough ants, you can deal with it. Um, here are the mole crickets, so they, they burrow through the earth um, and you can see them, you can, you can see where they're burrowing to with this sort of smoky effect that they're burrowing from above and you have to get soldiers there quickly to deal with them otherwise they're going to pick off your workers one by one which is really frustrating there they are burrowing into the nest they don't have a chance the um, the black ants, these, these are Formica Fusca black ants, but um, I don't think they have, they don't have stripes, do they? No, so the, the, the stripes here are so that you can see them um, as, as the player, because they're, they're difficult to identify otherwise. So some of, some of the ants have, have got stripes added, so it just makes it easier to see when, when you're playing the game. But otherwise, Formica Fusca ants. Okay. Something that we realized um, later on, because um, again, we were using assets for this grand uh, game on this giant island. Um, we, we didn't really care when we were designing that where the creatures were from, as long as they would hang around a beach, they could go into the beach level. And it was after we started to make these serious documentary missions, we realized people were kind of trusting the information in the, in the level. Um, and we'd got creatures from um, uh, Western Europe and uh, North America in the same zone, which wouldn't have happened. So we've tried to rectify that now. We've swapped the beach wolf spider with a sand bear wolf spider and the beach tiger beetle with the northern dune tiger beetle. So both of these um, are now European species and it could technically, everything that happens could all 
could all be together in the same place. And you can find these northern dune tiger beetles in the UK um, at, uh, at Crosby Beach, um, Merseyside. That's the one place they are in, in the UK. Okay, so I'll move through the, the next bits fairly quickly now. So we, we got our early access launch. Oh, sorry, Mike, I think I pressed this. No, it's the wrong one. Uh, we got our early access launch and um, we moved on to our leaf cutter update and we had a lot more time now. So we weren't in a rush so much anymore. We were making money, uh, we could work on the thing full time uh, and we could uh, spend some time making, uh, choosing the creatures rather than being forced to use the things that we had. We chose uh, Atacephalotes leaf cutter ants uh, because they have four casts, um, um, a minim, a minor, uh, a midi and a major ant, um, apart from, of course, the, um, the queen and, and, and the wing dance. Uh, so four different casts in the nest, distinct casts, was very exciting um, to implement. We also had time to do lots of creature research, so we, we, we honed in on an area in Ecuador, um, found uh, lots of different things that we wanted to add, a jumping spider, other rove beetles, the dwarf gecko didn't make it in, unfortunately, uh, but the velvet worm did, eventually. Um, the spiny devil bush cricket. Um, so all of these things, you know, we, we had the chance to choose creatures that we, we really liked the idea of uh, and implement those. Um, hooded leaf praying mantis didn't make it in. Someone decided we didn't need two leaf mimic praying mantises, so whip spider, trap jaw ant, lots of things made it in. Um, this is a video Mike made um, uh, showing off the forehead flies in the game. So these are little flies that will inject their eggs into the head of an ant um, and they will target leaf cutter ants, but the leaf cutter ant can defend itself. If the, if the fly comes around, it will fight it off um, with its mandibles. But if the leaf cutter ant's carrying a leaf, it can't defend itself. So that's when the forehead flies manage to get their eggs in. So one way ants deal with this is they take hitchhikers, the, the really tiny ants, um, and they'll climb on top of the leaf. And there's this whole battle that goes on. So you've got a, uh, an ant that's carrying a leaf that's got a little ant on top of the leaf who's having a little battle with a fly, uh, which is amazing. Um, and the, the way we dealt with that was once uh, an ant is level three, it gets a free hitchhiker, and then you're safe around forehead flies. That's how that works in the game. Um, we had a long, a long development period uh, for the for the fire ant update. This was really uh, a combination of us having to fix things that we made a mess of when we were rushing um, early on, uh, and we were also letting the uh, scope of the game get out of hand again. If I'm honest, uh, we had swarming fire ants climbing over giant uh, uh, bullfrogs. Um, we've got uh, ants that make bridges in water. Um, all of these required new systems and to go back and fix old things. So this is why everything took so long. But we got that finished and now we're hopefully we're quite close to um, the final launch. Uh, the, the fire run update, uh, the location was decided upon um, because of the Venus flytrap. So we knew we wanted fire ants and we also knew we wanted a Venus flytrap. Um, and I didn't realise until I actually looked it up that there's only one species of Venus flytrap. And it's only native to a very small area uh, in North America, um, in North Carolina, uh, near the Green Swamp. And so we had no choice but to base the update there. Fortunately, um, Solenopsis Invicta, the invasive uh, red fire ant, um, does travel far enough uh, in North America, up to North Carolina. It comes from South America, so it shouldn't be anywhere in America, but it's it's all over the place, um, and it's been making a mess there for the last hundred years. Um, and it does go, it does go that far north, but any further north, it's a bit cold for it. They also really don't like swamps. If they're on a uh, nuptial flight, they they won't land uh, anywhere near a swamp. But ours have been particularly unfortunate. Uh, they were heading out the, over the swamp and, and ran out of energy. So that's 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 what what happened in Empires of the Undergrowth. Um, Again, just showing some bits and pieces from our research of ants. Like none of us have a background in ants, so we had to learn everything from scratch. 
Um, we put some of these big headed ants in the game as well. We really like these. So um, there's, a, there's a cast in this colony, which is a, a super soldier. Um, and this is, this is very interesting. Again, there's probably experts on it in here, so I have to be careful about uh, embarrassing myself with, with poor facts. Um, but um, these, uh, these used to be more prevalent um, a long time ago. Um, but they're very, very expensive to produce, very resource heavy to, for the colony to produce a, a super soldier. So they'll tend to avoid doing it unless the colony has been put under a lot of constant stress uh, and it becomes worthwhile to have this super soldier um, and they can activate this cast that they wouldn't usually have. Um, and uh, what, what we did in the game is if there's a big headed ant colony, um, they're quite easy to deal with the first time, um, but once you've encountered them, they start making these super soldiers and then the next time you come across them, it's uh, uh, far more difficult. Okay, that's, that's the last slide. Uh, this is uh, a nice roadmap to the final version that Mike produced for us last week. Um, this is where, where are we at here? We're somewhere around here at the moment. Um, we're working our way to a 1.0 release, but there's, there's lots of stuff happening this summer um, and hopefully this won't be too far away. So, is there any questions? If you had in a, another species of ants to play as, what would it be? Ah, really? Uh, so many. Um, so, there's another species for the, the next tier. Are they announced, Mike? The next species, they're not announced, so I can't tell you. Uh, I can tell you there will be some termites coming. Um, other species that we'd like to do, I mean, we, we, we wanted to do weaver ants for a while, but it, uh, we, uh, the complexity of having them create their own nest out of leaves and, and webbing uh, was, uh, was quite difficult in the, in the current game, the way it is. Um, what are some others that we can't have? Oh, in the logo of the game, it's actually, uh, well, it's cover art, it's, it's not actually here, but there's always been a big bull ant uh, in one of the logos that we use that looks really menacing with long jaws. And there are no bull ants in the game um, because we've not gone to uh, East Asia. Um, so it, that would probably be the next place that we went um, and start adding those in. It really should be a bull ant in the game as well. Would you consider different consoles? Uh, yeah, so th this is on PC at the moment, um, but we are working on console ports at the moment. We're hoping um, it will work out. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's issues that we're a small development team, so it's hard to make another version. Um, but there are other issues like we have to optimize, optimize the game so it will work on console. And then we have to create all new control systems because this is designed to be played with a mouse and keyboard. But we do have, we've got an Xbox and a PlayStation development kit, so we're hoping it will come to both um, within the near future. That's the plan. Yeah? Are you planning on having any more maps? Oh, yeah, yeah, there'll be more maps. So there'll be, um, with the 1.0 release, there'll be new um, uh, campaign missions and so new documentary missions, um, a new Formicarium challenge, um, but there'll also be lots of uh, um, other little extra levels um, uh, th those those ones we do in between, you know, like the the special Christmas level and things like that. Whatever we decide is the next little fun thing we want to make. Okay. Yeah. So, so what do you think of all of the games on like Times Academy? Do you, do you see them as a threat as you have quite a small development? No, it's more. I mean, we're not making a mobile game, so uh, they're not really taking away our customers. Sometimes there was. There was a situation once which was quite sad. Somebody was had made, it was years ago now, um, uh, they'd made um, an app that mined um, cryptocurrency um, and they'd called it Empires of the Undergrowth and they'd put it on the, the, the store. And all it was is it was a loading screen that made your phone go very hot. And it mined Ethereum, I think, and, and sent it to an account. And what, and what, made me really quite sad about it was the, there was lots of reviews that were saying, that were giving it five stars and they were saying, it doesn't run for me, but um, I really like the, the, the PC version and I know the devs will fix it soon right. um, and all stuff like that. So it was kind of funny at first and then you realized all of these people thought we'd made a mess. Uh, um, but luckily Google took that down. 
But the other ones, the other mobile games, I, I don't know. Some people find the mobile game um, and then they talk about it on Facebook or whatever. And then somebody says, hey, you know, that's not the original, right? And then we get somebody coming to us from that. So it's more fun just to see it come about, I think. Yeah. AI improvements. Yeah, so um, the, okay, so free play is a mode in the game where um, you, you, you're not really in a documentary, you're just playing, say, colony versus colony uh, without a, a, any story to it. And there's an enemy colony there that is controlled by an AI. Um, and at the moment, um, that uh, AI was just grabbed from one of the previous documentary style missions. It was a leaf cutter colony and the AI was just set up for that campaign mission. Um, just to get free play done quickly, that was just used, and it's not particularly good in other settings. Um, so we've remade a, a new AI that is more modular, can be used in more situations, and at the moment we're putting that into free play. There should be a lot, lot more options with the AI. The AI should be cleverer. Um, it should be more interesting to play against, and hopefully. Back to that, which means Ah, uh, okay, so okay, all right. So AI is um, this isn't the kind of AI that is uh, uh, really uh, in the headlines at the moment. Right. The amazing deep learning stuff. Um, lots of things are called AI in video games. But basically, if something, if some decision is being made in the game, that's artificial intelligence called AI. There's no, there's no deep learning going on. This, this AI is really a massive tree of yes, no, is Ant doing this? Yes, no, okay, do this, yeah, and there's just loads of that that filters down into lots of different behaviors. Any more? No? Any discounts for your listeners? Any discounts, any discounts? Um, we will be doing a discount soon. Um, who... Who has you? So we, we, are you after the game on uh, we Xbox? Got it yet. Right. So you're no. looking. You're looking at uh, well, a console. Like for PC. For, for PC. PC yeah. Okay. Okay. So I would say keep an eye on the store page uh, in the next. Uh, mm, I don't want to be specific because everything changes, but there should be a, a discount coming up soon. soon. Yeah. Like yeah. Two yeah. Around there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's release the full version. Because I have the early access, like, so like, buy the full version, like, just Oh, no, no, the full version will be automatic. So if you've got the early access version, you'll get the full version. It'll just update to the full version when the full version comes out. Yeah. So if you buy it now, you'll get everything uh, that comes after it. Yeah. Yeah? Have you got any plans for multiplayer? Not in this version. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, okay, so again, it's a problem of us starting not knowing what we were doing, right? So we put loads of stuff in at the beginning that would now have to be pulled out and dealt with if we wanted multiplayer. We'd spend longer doing that than making a new game with multiplayer at this point. So it can't really go in, unfortunately, yeah. Okay, all right, brilliant. I'll, I'll let you go and cool off a bit. Ooh.